For those of you who have been here throughout the day uh, know that we've heard a lot about you know, how reparations for formerly enslaved people is not a new idea by any means. Uh, but we also heard a lot about how little communication there is on it and how what gets said is often veiled uh, at best. So, you know, it's, a, it's an idea that's been blocked, ignored, dismissed at every level of government here in the U.S. and elsewhere. And media organizations, I think, by and large, have followed suit. So there are, in fact, plenty of examples of reparations, some of which we've been hearing about in previous panels. Um, but when they're brought up, they're usually framed as something else. And when major media in particular is discussing reparations, happens to do so, it usually is in the con when reparations in the context of slavery, I should say, the lens on it is almost entirely economic. So we're going to examine whether any of that might be changing, uh, how to change it. And to do so, we brought together a, a journalist, working journalist, a media and communications scholar, and an activist who engage regu engages regularly with the media. Uh, uh, and audience members, I, uh, I know from our prep conversations that the members of this panel have more to say on the subject of reparations, health, and the media than we have time for if we talk all afternoon. Really exciting prep call, a lot of ideas. Uh, so we do want to hear your questions. When the time comes, please do line up at the microphone, and I will steal Natalia's brilliant idea, and uh, we'll follow suit there. So I want to briefly introduce our panel. Um, I'll start from my right. Uh, if, yeah, this is good. I can do it. Uh, Meredith D. Clark. She's an associate professor and founding director of Northeastern University's Center for Communication, Media Innovation, and Social Change. Her research focuses on the intersections of race, media, and power. Her first book, We Tried to Tell Y'all, Black Twitter and Digital <laughs> Counter Narratives, is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. In the middle, we have Dreeson Heath. She's a researcher and advocate in Human Rights Watch's United States program. She's focusing on racial justice issues. She's a reparations activist who's working to help individuals who are affected by systemic racism overcome its impact and enact transformative and structural change. And to my immediate right, Deborah D. Douglas is co-editor-in-chief of The Emancipator, an abolitionist newspaper for the modern era. She's also a senior leader for the Op-Ed Project and author of The Moon Traveler's Guide to the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. So thank you all for being with us today. And we're just going to plunge right in. And Meredith, I want to start with you. You have advocated for what you call reparative journalism, reparative journalism. Please tell us, what does that mean? Yes. Thank you for the question. So when I talk about reparative journalism, um, it's an examination of how journalism has contributed to the inequalities that we see manifest today. Um, I'm a firm believer that news and news media help us understand our world. They help us think about the constructions of what our world is. And so reparative journalism is a different approach, one that recognizes that as journalism was formed in this country, it was formed through the strategic omission of people who were not white, wealthy, male landowners. They, these were the folks who got to set the guidelines, the practices, the norms and values that characterize what journalism is today. Reparative journalism takes those folks who were more marginalized and who continue to be marginalized, and it puts their perspectives and their vulnerabilities in particular at the center of the practice. So rather than reporting on the news in a way that really serves elite interests, the kind of news that we see now, we're talking about news reports that focus on what it means to be structurally disempowered. So stories that we have right now, the ones uh, that are most sticking out in my mind right now, of course, the economy, we're hearing a lot of reports about how people are really nervous about the economy and that's driving their votes. A reparative journalism frame would look in its specific communities and through the audiences that it serves and find those people who are really at the mercy of the economy that they seek to talk about, those people who threaten or have a, a risk of losing perhaps health benefits or food benefits, those people who, when we talk about jobs really grossly, we're talking about folks who are engaged in contract-based labor and being very explicit about what it means for them 
to have to tangle with the decisions that are being made about the economy. So really focusing on vulnerability, structural vulnerability, and using that as a locus for reporting. I mean, Deborah, this sounds to me like what we're supposed to be doing anyway. We're supposed to get perspectives from all angles of a story, right? Like, newsrooms do require their journalists to be objective, what we call kind of a, a standard, and it's supposed to be driven in part by getting multiple points of view, by not framing this for, you know, for the, the benefit of the powerful, the elites. In fact, you know, we're told that we can't contribute to candidates, we can't tribute, contribute to political parties, we can't contribute to causes we might want to support, we can't show up for protests, uh, by and large. Like my old newsroom at the Boston Globe actually made a special exception for Black Lives Matter when that, when the, when that movement started in the wake of George Floyd's murder, to be able to go as journalists to protests to marches and not face consequences at work, right? Like, that's supposed to be our way of getting to be objective. So, so Meredith is saying, like, we're not actually doing our jobs, and I'm curious about whether these traditional boundaries that are in place, uh, how they come into play when it comes to reporting reparations. Yeah, well, I, I would start with the word traditional, or we could call it legacy media, or we can call it white-owned media that serves white people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start Some there. Some white people. <laughs> right. I would say that um, I've, I've worked in legacy media, but I've worked in uh, the startup world also, especially in the, the nonprofit news space where people are, are breaking form and, and building back a new way of storytelling and bearing witness for the, the new and the next generation. And so that's where the some people went. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would say that... Um, Objectivity as it has been practiced by people like you and me and um, imposed on people like you and me has never been true objectivity as in a respect for or an embrace of um, objective truth. What, what we traditionally call objectivity, I look at as a white cis male Western default. And, um, and anything that doesn't fit in that container uh, does not rise to the level of the kind of appropriate news judgment that traditionally fits the frame of what, uh, what we bear witness to. Uh, I have a better <laughs> approach that I, that I teach as a journalism professor and that I engage in with other like-minded journalists. Um, I follow a, a rubric of excellence as defined by Mar uh, Maria Lynn Rios and Ernest Perry in their book, Cross-Cultural Journalism, that um, it contains these elements, context, complexity, voices, authenticity, and proportionality. And I think you get a much better story when you're centering people in the story in a proportional way. And what does that mean for underserved communities? Proportional means that you, first of all, you render them <laughs> in full in the narrative. You go into the communities, you develop relationships, and you include them in the story. You include their voices. And you provide context, which is really why the emancipator exists, because we feel like the, a lot of the, the, the work of traditional media fails to offer the historical context that we're living in. It's, like, it's reactive. It's surface level. We know that there's nothing new under the sun. And if we could just make those connections and pull those through lines, we would have a better understanding of our lived experience and our experience of um, our social policies. Um, that we all um, either benefit from or not, because as we know, um, there are systems in this country that are built for some people to win all the time and for other people to lose all the time. And we don't spend nearly enough time in our reporting excavating why that is. And I'll just say in terms of um, this idea of objectivity, <laughs> again, there's objective truth. But I, I think we're duty-bound to acknowledge our, our biases, our implicit biases and our explicit biases, and then calibrate for that as you're reporting. Like, I acknowledge that I have these sort of, like, default tendencies or, or default experiences. And so I think that if, we, if we're just honest about that and then we calibrate to make sure that we are inclusive of people who don't look like us and live like us, we can get a a better, a better form of journalism. And I'll just stop by saying that when my students, my undergrads come to me, uh, I taught journalism for 15 years, um, they'll come and say, I don't have a story, Professor Douglas, I don't have a story to write. 
I'm like, there's stories all over the place. You just have to reach out and grab it like a firefly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, the BLS, the Bureau of Research has, has a, um, releases a report every month. And they have this downloadable calendar you can put in your phone. And you can put it on an alarm. And you can never miss a story. Because there's so many great data points that you can humanize. And I can tell you, in any, any given month, black people will be more employed than anybody else. Brown people will be employed a little bit less. <laughs> and there are whole groups of people who are not being counted at all. And every month, you're invited to tell that story in a different way than legacy media, which usually tells the story from the perspective of how many jobs in this town were created, what new businesses came to town, what free money we gave out, tax breaks, to these people. And we never asked the question, how many of these jobs pay a living wage? How many of these jobs uh, provide a pathway into the middle class that you can, that will sustain you, that will exist, and to help you begin to build generational wealth. And and to one of the things I just wanted to add to that uh, is that in the wake of George Floyd's murder, you saw a lot of newsrooms do audits, self audits. Uh, some of you may be familiar with these. As a media person, I probably paid more attention to them than maybe the average citizen, but. It's startling to see where newsrooms would publish these, the lack of diversity in their sourcing, the lack of diversity in the kind of topics they covered, uh, the predictability uh, based on stereotype, broadly, broadly held stereotypes of the way the stories were played across like, the best newsrooms in the country. So this is, there's data out there to support everything that Deborah just said. So, uh, and, and Dresen, uh, to follow up on her point on uh, on the way that the stories that we don't cover, the people we don't cover, you know, even when we see reparations covered from the question of, an econom of economics, you know, we, see, we see very narrow reporting uh, on that subject within it. But how does it overall limit the scope of the coverage that we see on reparations that you see as an activist and when you're interacting with media trying to get them to look at different angles? Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. And I just, it's a pleasure to be here with Meredith, Deborah, and Michael for this conversation. Um, you know, as you just stated, uh, it is narrowed to an economic issue. And, and um, me and many activists uh, in this space, if you're going to cure the disease, you have to cure it in, in its full entirety or as proportional to the levels of harm as possible. Um, and that means accounting for the full range of economic damage. That means having a conversation even beyond the racial wealth gap. That means talking about predatory lending, banking discrimination, and other forms of discrimination that are present day uh, harms that deserve remedy as well as past and historical harms. But we know the legacy of enslavement has rendered not just economic damage, but also political damage, psychological damage, mental damage, um, other forms of, of physical damage. Um, and we have to fully account for all of those harms. And, and they deserve a different remedy. Uh, sometimes it's going to be compensation. Um, and sometimes it's, it's going to look different than that. Um, when we're talking about the legacy of enslavement, right, we're trying to encapsulate sexual violence. We're trying to account for uh, the war on drugs, over-incarceration, um, again, uh, predatory lending, de facto segregation, and all the various forms we see play out today. Um, but it does a disservice when we um, name, for instance, uh, economists as authority on the issue merely because the people are at the center of the issue. Um, reparations is supposed to be a community-controlled, victim-centered process. The people determine what their repair looks like. And not in all communities is the ask financial compensation. In other communities, I, you can look to Argentina with Los Madres, who um, in the wake of, of, of war and conflict, their children were disappeared. Their reparations ask and demand is for their children to be returned um, and for them to have a right to return to their uh, community and also an apology by an official apology by the government, right? This is going, there's no one size fits all reparations program. So we have to take it one community at a time. Um, I think about 
the Tulsa Race Massacre survivors and descendants who I've spent years um, in community with. Um, and I think about how in the aftermath of the massacre, 8,000 people were rounded up into concentration camps, given green identification cards. This is concentration camps in the US in 1921. Given identification cards, severe malnutrition occurred, stillbirths occurred, um, additional health harms occurred. That has to be accounted for. There's still no hospital in North Tulsa today after that hospital was destroyed in 1921. Um, I think about other examples. I think about some of the people in Florida whose, whose um, felony convictions bar them from voting, right? Mm -hmm. Where they have exorbitant fees and fines after they come out of prison, right? We're talking about $60,000, over $100,000 that they have to pay prior to voting. But what is the psychological damage they've endured while in the carceral system? How do we measure and account for that in addition to the fact that they have to pay for the restoration, maybe for the restoration of the right to vote because there's legislation on the books now that are curbing even your access to that. So we have to think beyond that. I also think about the black couple in, in California that was reported that their um, appraisal was um, lowballed, uh, $460,000, um, $460,000, right? That's a half a million dollars. And if we're talking about the maybe one reparation payment we get, even if it's over a half a million dollars, that doesn't account for um, their accum wealth accumulation past that time. That doesn't account for the psychological damage that occurred by them having a put their white friends into their household and, and, and stand in for them, right? Are we all going to call our white friends when we want to buy a home? Um, you know, these are the things that we have to be um, thinking about when we're thinking about remedy and comprehensive reparations programs. We have to be thinking in the most expansive and holistic way um, that really targets the needs of that specific community. I want to I want to follow up on that, but I also wanted to wondered if you might just share briefly something you share with us on the prep call. You're, you're from Tulsa, and I asked you how this was how the, how the massacre was covered in the Tulsa press, and you, you're sort of a student of this. Could you share with our our audience what you shared with us on the prep call? Sure, I can remember. <laughs> um, no, I was born in Tulsa. Um, I am not a descendant of the massacre. I did not actually grow up in Tulsa. But my parents, my young parents survived that place because of some of the survivors. At that time, there were 130 plus survivors still alive when I was born. And the survivors were a part of the community that literally kept them alive as my young parents taking care of this, um, this little baby. And, you know, it's intentionally silenced, right? It's a systematic silencing of this story in a way where the newspapers are also in the business of not only um, perpetuating the massacre, because they also help call for the lynching right. of, of Dick Rowland, who is just used as, a, unfortunately, a poster boy and victim um, within this process when we all know that oil was dry, drying up in Oklahoma, white people were like this black community is thriving over here and is one of the wealthiest communities, not just among black folks, but around the entire right. country, right? We are going to run them out and ensure that Greenwood never survives again, right? Yeah. In 1921, in the 1960s, where they run the highway through the yeah. um, uh, community, and even today where they're displacing black residents out of the Greenwood community building minor leagues, baseball stadiums, uh, uh, Olympic BMX uh, arena, and putting up a history center, which everyone thinks is, is representative of the community, but is actually um, further displacing and, and in the right. not considering the likeness of the people that they're trying to represent. And the thing that I thought was striking that you had said, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase it, was that you know, for 80 years, there were no stories about what had happened in Tulsa, in the local paper, which is supposed to be 
we're all trained, told we're supposed to be holding, you know, uh, speaking truth to power, right? Holding the powerful uh, accountable. None of that's going on in this context. Mm -hmm. So the, the follow-up I wanted to ask just on the, the broadening out of coverage is you, you've said that health harms need a health remedy. And I'm curious about how, how if we applied that framing to, you know, uh, what, would, what, what would it look like if we applied that framing to the need for reparations coverage and the way the media approaches it? How would it change? Yeah, it would be a sea change. Um, you know, you're seeing cities and states declare racism as a public health crisis, for instance, right? That invokes a reparative response. We should, journalists should be making that connection when those uh, city council resolutions are coming out and those declarations are happening. Um, when you think about, again, accounting for extrajudicial extrajudicial killings of black people in this country. That is a public health issue. Um, we've heard about uh, some of the other symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, premature aging, life expectancy rates. Um, the suicide rate for black youth is of the, um, uh, of the highest among any racial and ethnic group. It's the second leading cause of death for black youth aged 10 to 19. Right, these are the legacies of enslavement playing out in our current day society. Um, I think about government imposed segregation um, that has created the zip codes for which you live near a trash incinerator, you live near an oil refinery, or maybe you don't live near the oil refinery, but the, the, the wind blows west to your zip code and therefore your life expectancy rate is 10 years less than the zip code next to you. Um, thinking about how black women are dying at three times the rate of preventable diseases when they're, when they're pregnant, right? When they're dying of cervical cancer, a preventable disease at two times the rate of their white counterparts. That is systemic injustice. That needs a systemic reparative response. So I want to see journalists cover these stories. I want them to see, I want them to go directly to those people right, who are experiencing the harms and allow them to tell that story. Yeah. Um, I want to see folks going to legacy organizations and, and activists who have been on the ground for decades doing this work prior to this conversation, right, where, where health has been called as a, as a comprehensive remedy by many people on the ground doing this work prior to this moment. Um, so... Even in the case of um, the Chicago Police Torture Victims Reparations Program, right? That's one of the robust, most robust local reparations programs we have for a very specific harm. Um, and that includes a, a center for trauma-informed care. I would love to see a story following up on those families. It, it extended to the family because we know that trauma extends to your household and to your community. I'd love to see a follow-up piece humanizing the issue of reparations to where we actually know that these trauma-informed care practices and that trauma-informed care remedy has actually rendered some type of positive and transformative response in these people's lives. Deb, you stay here. I'm going to go start that story. You, um, <laughs> don't you chase it just yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm all no, over this. I mean, it's a, it's a, these are great ideas. And actually, I do want to turn to the audience for a minute and say, you know, you are our interested party. You probably know more about what the media says about reparation than I would say the, the typical American. I'm just curious about the stories that Dreesen's mentioning. How many of you have heard some of these stories, are familiar with them, have seen them in media? I'm just curious for a show of hands. So even in an audience like this, we're going to let less than half the hands up for these stories. So, Meredith, I want to continue on this theme around health-driven narratives and, you know, what a shift might mean or look like. Um, I know you have some examples of how we've seen an issue in public health reframed mm -hmm. through a shift to this kind of health-driven narrative. One of those would be, for instance, uh, the difference between the way the opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. epidemic has been covered versus the way the crack cocaine crisis was covered. Uh, can you talk a bit you know, about a, a bit more about ways in which changing the health narrative to a health narrative reframes conversations, reframes media coverage? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there are a number of changes within reparative journalism that have to take place in order for us to make the change of those frames, right? Um, it includes our reporting practices and everything from even the journalist handbook, the AP style book. Uh, one of the things that I like to note about this is that until 2019, according to the journalist Bible, journalists couldn't talk about actual racism. They couldn't call something racist because it was not in the AP style book, right? Uh, so shifting that frame requires layers of practice. And so if one of those is shifting the difference, say, between the way papers and television stations covered uh, the crack epidemic of the late 80s, early 90s, to the way that we're now covering the opioid crisis, we see a lot of emphasis on the antecedents that lead people to use opioids or to abuse them. We did not see that with coverage of the crack epidemic. The crack epidemic was covered as though this were something that hundreds of thousands of people just decided to do on a Friday night, and that's how they got hooked on drugs rather than taking it a look at the communities that they came from, what options were available to them, um, looking at issues like the ones that aren't spoken aloud, like epidemics of abuse within families and why people turn to substance abuse because they don't get counseling. They can't get counseling. It's not available to them. And so shifting to a health frame really requires that we think about a lot of different points of intersection of identity and access and what it means for someone to have a particular lived experience. So now when someone's writing about the opioid crisis, um, I, well, actually I'll, I'll back up a little bit. We write about the crack epidemic, a frame, a health frame for thinking about how we covered the crack epidemic in the past is to really do a deep dive on the, uh, frankly, the misinformation, the disinformation that was advanced during the crack epidemic. You know, we were told that uh, children born to addicted mothers were going to have uh, disparities in terms of their learning acquisition and of their development. And 20 to 30 years later, we're finding that none of that was true. That the children who were born addicted as they grew up kept pace with their peers but we're not seeing reporting on the same caliber that we saw at the time that completely demonized these mothers and basically assigned these children to a second or third tier status. Mm -hmm. So now the framing that we need to take on is thinking about how we're talking about people who um, are struggling with substance abuse, their children, and what sort of outcomes we might expect, and doing that in a way that is human-centered, doing it in a way that is person-centered. So, Deb, let's, Deborah, let's talk about how the media frames other forms of reparations. Um, uh, the recently passed PACT Act, which is, expands health care and benefits for millions of veterans exposed to toxins from Agent Orange in Vietnam to the open-air burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. These could be called reparations, right? Uh, but, the, you know, the benefits are meant to repair harm done by the military, to, or flawed military policy, exposing lots of veterans to, uh, to toxins. They're never framed that way. Um, you know, the headlines are about aid for sick veterans. How would reframing media coverage to call this kind of action reparations, uh, well, would reframing this kind of media coverage to call it reparations move the general public toward uh, being more accepting of the idea of reparations broadly for black Americans? Well, I think if you frame it as reparations, then that gives people the idea that there's an opportunity here to explore it in other areas. And reparations is, is always, I think it's perceived to be aligned with the black experience. And so we know the problems that we have with um, respecting and centering the black experience in this country. So I would say that um, I have so many thoughts about this. Um, there's some actually really great research going on here with Cornell William Brooks and Linda Vilnas on mm -hmm. reparations. And the question that um, uh, Professor Brooks asked is if reparations are radical or routine. And so I think that that example that you gave, the PACT Act, is an example of the routine nature of reparations that uh, they have identified in their research. 
that we have so many categories of reparations. We're in a constant state, perpetual motion machine of reparations in this country, that we can give reparations according to Professor Brooks to Christmas tree, Christmas tree farmers. And so I think that the fix is in, the, they don't want us to know. They do this all the time. And um, there, the, there's this idea that they, they cost so much money and we couldn't possibly pay for that, but we do this all the time. And we really know this now as a result of the pandemic and, um, and the, the funding that we got that the government can, government can move quickly to make sure that people are covered and, um, and can cover their bills and do what they need to do. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that can happen too. But <laughs> so it's really like some of these conversations are framed as subsidies. Some of these conversations are framed as, as grants or incentives. Yeah, so it's it's people in the of... newsroom who are not really adequately prepared to shift the frame, to be honest, because you graduate, you go to work, and then you, you write for the rest of your life, and you let your thinking get fossilized. And then managers, producers, editors don't encourage you to replenish your thought process about the language that you use. There's not a practice of freeing reporters to go out and just listen to communities and not extract data and information and anecdotes from communities, but just listen to hear what they're saying. And I was, as I was listening to the examples that you gave, Dreesen, and you, Meredith, I thought about an exciting practice that we engage in as the Emancipator, but in other places too, which is solutions journalism practice. And it is a practice that uh, looks at pressing social problems through a very specific kind of reporting lens that uh, requires you to go into community and to, um, to talk to people, listen to people, to, to, to hear their definitions and their experience of their lived experience and what's holding them back and what's pushing them forward. Um, the way I like to put it is that solutions journalism allows you to show communities being agents of their own salvation. And we don't do that enough in journalism. I've had editors tell me, don't bring me a Namby Pamby do gooder story. But it's not a Namby Pamby do gooder story. It's getting to know your community. It's serving your community. And it's not, this is the second part of it that I like, it's not deficit framing them, rendering them as perpetual victims mm -hmm. who can't figure anything out. Mm -hmm. um, they can figure it out, given the resources that they have. They do a lot with the resources that they have, and we are we have a responsibility to understand that, so we can understand what our our contribution and investment should be to help them purpose themselves to be better the next day and the next day. And we do this by taking these these data points. This one bad thing that happened to a group of people. If I say South Side of Chicago, what comes up for you? If you read the national media. You would think crime. Well, that's the direction, the south side of Chicago. That's not, not like a specific place. It's made up of communities, made up of neighborhoods, made up of blocks, made up of homes with all kinds of families. And if we don't stop deficit framing these communities, right, by the opposite of it is asset framing, yeah. right, asking the question, who do they purpose themselves to be as they get up every day? What is their big vision of life? When you ask the question from that, from that perspective, who do you want to be? Who are you trying to be? What is your vision from life, for life? You get such a different story. And I have had the opportunity to actually put this into practice. And it's, it's miraculous and it's magical. And if we could just all embrace it, we could just do this so much better. Well, and, and to this point, to reinforce what you're saying about how we cover certain kinds of neighborhoods, the, the Boston Globe magazine, where I worked before I came here, does a, a you know, top places to live issue every year, basically looking at you know, areas that have seen the, the most growth in, high, fastest growth in prices over a five year period. And it, a couple years ago, we had a neighborhood in Boston that, uh, that was a largely black neighborhood. And you know, I'm putting this together for the, our web version of it, looking for some related links. What's the Globe written about this neighborhood? I only found stories about crime, crime. and I'm thinking, <laughs> This is one of our top places to live. This, this neighborhood is seeing some of the fastest price appreciation in the entire Boston area. There has got to be some other kind of story there mm -hmm. that we're not telling, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, it's not a, this is a, might feel a little far field from reparations, but when you have newsrooms, I think, that are not thinking more broadly about 
the cities that they're in, where they're sending reporters, what are the neighborhoods that they're covering, what, sto what pictures and images they're showing, right? Yeah, Michael, actually, I wrote a travel book about the Civil Rights Trail, so I spent a lot of time in the South, in black communities, all those places where the interstates ran through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's so much history. It's like I, I had no idea what, 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 what treasure surrounded me. And then I, I went back home to Chicago, and I started looking at Chicago anew. And it's because they don't put us on the map. The tourism departments don't put us on the map. They don't have an arrow and say, go to this community and engage with this story and engage with this history. Because the deficit frame says that if you go in that direction, it will be dangerous. And that's not always the case. And if, and if we don't value this space, and we don't take a collective responsibility for caretaking the narrative of this place, we'll never get that investment. No, and, and we're not able to, I heard a bell. Okay, sorry. There it is again. Um, I wanted to actually briefly say, uh, maybe turn to the audience again and say, so how many of you are frustrated with, with newspapers and magazines, broadcast television, uh, journalism, uh, radio journalism? Yeah, most of you. So I want to just throw this out to the panel and say, does the reparations movement need conventional, traditional media? Can social media drive the conversation and drive change, perhaps in a way that, say, black Twitter has for the Black Lives Movement? I'll, I'll start with you, Meredith. I'm curious about what everyone thinks. Do we need the traditional media anymore, or can we look at other sources to drive the conversation? We need every tool that we have available. Mm -hmm. We need every single one. I think it's, um, it's, it's something that's specific to uh, I guess Western societies, because that's where I am positioned and that's the way I see things, that we often think that we need to totally reinvent uh, things or come up with a new tool or an innovation in order to address a problem. But one of the things that I point out to people is that all of the media that came before social media, they all still exist. So before social media, you know, we had television, before television, radio, before radio, newspapers, all of those media still exist. And there's a reason for that. Uh, not everyone's on social media. And we've seen with the problems that we've had over the last, you know, folks have been paying attention, more attention for the last four to six years, but we've had these problems for quite some time. Um, but misinformation and disinformation and how it moves so quickly via social media, we cannot rely on social media use to be the only tool that we have for doing this work of reparations. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we, you know, we need to look at how we've created the structures that we have for sharing information, for gathering and sharing information examine where they have left folks out and where they have exploited weaknesses and vulnerabilities, uh, address those, repair those, right? And work from there to use those tools to our advantage to do this work. Other thoughts on, anyone disagree yeah. that, you know, maybe we don't actually need, can leave the traditional media behind? No, unfortunately, I think it's too much of an influence on our public discourse to dismiss. And I, I agree with using all the tools that we have. Um, I just believe that it should be diligent and thoughtful and a compassionate approach to these real stories. Like reparations to other people are a buzzword, are, uh, uh, um, you know, a uh, uh, it is a process, but beneath that process are human beings. And so going to where the people are at, knowing their lived experience, humanizing, again, humanizing reparations, humanizing reparations in a way that doesn't make it so distant. Again, I'm sorry, the PAC Act and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the reparations program for Camp Lejeune victims mm -hmm. is a reparations program. Mm -hmm. And they ha are entitled under international human rights law and other uh, legal jurisdictions to a right to remedy. There is a right to reparation and a right to remedy. Part of what I feel like our failures are in the US is that we don't actually have a human rights framing mm -hmm. to this work where, um, and to these processes where this is actually clearly defined and clearly replicated by other countries 
Um, it also uh, speaks directly to self-determination and what communities can do for themselves, for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. at, at times, you know, we're, we're running through brick walls and the perpetrators aren't gonna give us <laughs> what we need, right? And so I've heard these reflections earlier of starting within the self, starting within the community and going outward but there is a, 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 an extreme responsibility by the media to be diligent and investigative about this. When you're reporting, for instance, you know, I've heard some back and forth on HR 40 earlier today, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparations Proposals. Look, folks, disagree or agree, this is the only reparations, federal reparations bill we have in Congress right now that will render actual proposals. The, we have enough votes <laughs> to uh, pass it out of the House, right? Sure, the Senate is a roadblock. Biden can sign an executive order to set up this commission today. The media frames this as an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. Instead, they should be asking congressional leadership, they should be calling the White House, why are you intentionally stalling this bill? Right? There is enough votes on the books. There's already an article by the Washington Post, Emanuel Felton, who has already named we have the votes. Why isn't there interrogation around the stalling of this in the midst of slavery remembrance day passing? In the midst of Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday, which you know was a direct response to the reparations bill having enough votes. So I want journalists to be able to take a deep dive and inform the public in a way that is truthful. Do not say this is an uphill battle. I'm not sure that, that Juneteenth as a holiday was something that I saw framed as a response to H.R. 40. But. Well, it's not publicly, <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, that's also the untold public story. Yeah, so, so I just want to note the microphones are open. We have a couple of questions that are, are a couple of questioners there, but I did quickly say, want to say, Deb, so, so I could say what Dreesen's asking for with the, the why aren't the media pushing these questions, pushing this, using the words like stalling. Mm -hmm. Those, would you teach questioning like that to your first year basic journalism students? Or would you say, we want to frame this, we don't want to, that's a leading question, we don't want to frame it that way. I mean, Ida B. Wells and Ida Tarbell asked leading questions. Sure. We got some compelling <laughs> answers, so I think we know where, where that leads. And I believe in using all of our tools too, but I think we also need to think about who's qualified to tell the story, who has the right to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people working in our newsrooms that we need, we need, we need change, right? right? They're not qualified to tell these stories. So we need to like rejigger and shift who, the newsroom makeup, especially at the de decision making level, uh, so that we can um, have people who have the, the foundational experience and undergirding to be able to. To, to shift the frame. And just with regard to the social media question, um, we have a social first approach at the Emancipator because there are people who will never go to a website and read anything. They're not gonna read 800 words. So in addition to getting out and being in conversation and being in community and just listening without extraction, we try to meet people in the social media streets where they are with all the information. So if they see enough information, um, explainers, news, commentaries, insights over and over and over again, hopefully they can engage with that and, and, and keep up with the issues and learn along the way and be in community along the way. And so we need to break that, that elitist kind of hierarchical structure that looks at a social way of communication as being a, a, lesser, a lesser form of life. Um, if they're getting their news from social media instead of clutching your chest, mm -hmm. then get with the program mm -hmm. and give them information where they are. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, we're going to move to the microphones. I, we have a question over here. From Hello. Um, my name is Katie Mogg, and I am a correspondent with the Boston Globe, and I'm also a college student at Northeastern University. Go Huskies. <laughs> <laughs> So um, my question for anybody on the panel is, what is your advice for young journalists, especially young journalists of color like myself, how can they ensure that they um, can help turn the tide 
from traditional journalism and make sure that stories are telling the whole truth, especially for marginalized communities, especially when like we're stuck at the bottom of the totem pole and we don't have much influence. So what, what can we do in that position? You wanna go first? You can go first. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be really brief. Thank you for the question. Uh, one of the things is to remember that you're not alone in doing this and to do that coalition building because um, we will get exhausted, burn out, and frankly die before the work is done, uh, especially if we're trying to do it individually. So doing the coalition building. Um, but just creating room and, and doing the job that you're working on very well. One of the things that I like to point to uh, everyone's been enamored with the 1619 Project, but before the 1619 Project, and the thing that allowed Nicole Hannah-Jones to be able to do such an influential project was her deep dive into the resegregation of public schools in the United States. And that was years of investment, years of time, years of being in those neighborhoods and reporting really closely on uh, the schools that were being carved up by different neighborhoods, right? there's no substitution for us spending time there and doing the work. Now, maybe we have to pitch the story a little bit differently so we get to tell um, a longer story over time, but there is nothing that, that really uh, can be substituted for the investment of time, which we often don't have. There's something to say for learning the form and then really well and then breaking the form. And so I would just encourage you to see um, the possibility and what you're being taught at a foundational level, level. But also I would encourage you to talk to your professors about your concerns. And you know, a lot of students, they'll get in and get out, you know, mm -hmm. come to class, come to lab, do the thing, and then leave. But if you really engage with the process and develop a relationship and a dialogue with your professor, then you can maybe, maybe lay the groundwork to like tease out how your ideas and your values intersect with what you're what you're producing, I'm, and I'm talking about it a line by line level, because that's the kind of editor that I am. I remember talking to a student who was um, grappling with some issues around identity at the time. They now identify as trans, but at the time they were on this journey. And so we talked about the, how those values married to the kind of reporting that they were doing. And they wanted to do some things that weren't in the AP style book. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I didn't Thank go, you. oh, well, let's just do this. Okay, let's do it your way. You know, we can't have 75 students coming into a lab and everybody does it a different way. But I invited her to, to research this with me. Let's look at patterns and practices and, and who is using this language in this way and at, at this level and at this level and at this level. And what is the quality of the conversation now? Mm -hmm. And we came up with some compromises to meet in the middle. And I didn't want to sh shut this person down, and I did not want to kill their spirit. <laughs> I think it's very important that you don't kill your student's spirit. But if you're open and in dialogue, then I think that you can impress upon mm -hmm. your instructors what your value system is. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would just chip in that the same thing is probably true in your newsroom. Uh, uh, so you'll, you'll, have, you'll have professors that are more receptive, more, uh, more accommodating, more interested in being mentors than other professors. And so you might need to sort of pick and choose the conversations you have. The same will be true in newsrooms across, you know, you'll get different editors of different types. Um, but I, I think you shouldn't sort of look at yourself as saying, I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. I'm a, I'm a student. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm from a marginalized community. No one's going to pay attention to me. It, you, mm -hmm. you have a currency because of who you are, you are bringing things to your newsroom, to your classroom, mm -hmm. right? That that are um, expansive, that help can help change that whole narrative and discussion. And honestly, I think most people who are editors in newsrooms right now, particularly people who look like me, understand on some level that the world is not the same as it was in the 1960s and 70s when we were growing up. The way that the, even the word racism and how what 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 it means is is not what it was in the 1970s and 1980s, right? You have a currency of this is you, you know this new world. Your editor does not know this new world. Um, you also know a lot more about uh, uh, new communities. Boston is not the same place now 
as it was in the 1990s when I first moved here. And, but the, the perspective of somebody who's been sitting in a newsroom at the Globe for 30 years is not going to have shifted. They're not going to know this. You're going to know it. If you can frame that conversation with your editor around something that, hey, is new, is different, is real, that person is going to, be, is going to have to be inclined to listen. Uh, or really, they shouldn't. They should be getting shoved out of the newsroom. <laughs> you should go around them, honestly. But you, you are, don't, don't undervalue yourself. Don't undervalue what you see on the ground. Use your reporting skills and say, look, these are the conversations I'm having with people. These are the things that are important to them. This is the way they are using language, right? Um, so, because they, they, you can reframe this conversation for them. I mean, I hope you don't have to work that hard to do it, but, but don't, 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 you are at the top of the totem pole, okay? Your own totem pole, but it's, you know, it's important. I don't even like using the word totem pole, but, you know, anyway. There was another person, oh, so there, I, if you wanted to ask. Thank you. Um, my name is Leah Samuel, and I have been a journalist for 30 years, and I'm lucky Could enough to... Could you speak to... up just a little, to, or move the microphone a little harder? Hi, my name is Leah Samuel. Yeah, yeah. Better? Okay. <laughs> and um, I have been a journalist for 30 years, and I'm lucky to have started at a black newspaper, mm -hmm. um, an African-American interest newspaper in Detroit, my hometown, um, mm -hmm. called The Michigan Citizen. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to cover and write about reparations a long time ago when it was a very fringe type of thing. Um, and also when the idea of a black person running for president was a fringe type of thing. And I remember people like Lenora Filani mm -hmm. and um, um, I think, who is it? Jesse Jackson also ran for president. And so I'm interested and curious about what you guys think of what happens when something moves from the fringes to kind of more or less mainstream as reparations seems to be kind of sort of doing right now. When the voices change, when the people who are talked, who are spoken to, who are interviewed, who are reached out to, are not necessarily the same ones who have been focusing on the issue for the longest time. But in fact, the newer voices, the voices that maybe the media is more accustomed to. I'm just curious about yeah. so that. You, you raise a great point, Leah, about how, in fact, uh, smaller newspapers, le less mainstream newspapers, newspapers that were serving the black community have actually probably done a pretty good job with reparations for quite a while, but have been on the fringes outside of the coverage. And then when the voices shift and they go over to, uh, and, and the, the conversation goes into uh, the mainstream media, how does it change? And more, if and anybody more feels pointedly, like they want to address that, is, is that the way of framing it? Sorry, go ahead. More importantly, more pointedly, who they talk to yeah. when the when it becomes more mainstream. I mean, I'm thinking not. going from Lenora Polani to I mean, Barack Obama, for example. Yeah, I, I just want to say this is an intergenerational struggle. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, people who, you know, uh, if there's still alive or their descendants are still alive that you were talking to 20 years ago are also relevant to this conversation today in the same ways that the new voices are. I mean, I can say I'm one of those newer voices, right? And there are people whose backs I stand on that I organize with now um, on the national and local levels. And there are times where you know, I'm taking a step back and making sure that their name is pushed forward and their work isn't erased. Um, and there are times where we got to switch up the speed a little bit and, and put a different, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, line of expertise, but also a different flavor on a, a, a current conversation. And so um, I, I hear that in, in terms of, you know, where to even find people and how to, um, how to identify folks. Um, but I also, I, I guess I hope we keep a through line between who we've been talking to and, and who um, are, are also currently, um, you know, integral in, in, in trying to support the movement as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kwame. How you doing? Uh, my name is Kwame Adams. I'm from Boston. I'm an educator. Um, here, as I heard you all speak, there were a lot of things that resonated with me in terms of talking about humanizing. Can you speak into the microphone? Sorry, can you hear me now? Thank you. Yeah. I'll just hold the mic. 
Um, humanizing praxis in terms of making sure that they see us fully, understanding our history, understanding our future, so on and so forth. As an educator, I'm often in spaces, and I'll use the media, like where we see there were a number of books on critical race theory, on critical race theory um, that were on the New York Times bestseller list. Ibram Kendi at BU, just everyone is so happy with the Black Lives Matter signs in their yard, on Washington <laughs> Street, in Nubian Square, because uh, I'm from here and still say Dudley sometimes. In Nubian Square, they have Black Lives Matter um, in the street. Mm -hmm. But as a community member, you know that much hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm in schools, I do school improvement work. Not much has changed, despite people reading these books. Mm -hmm. As folks in the media, what do you think the media has to do to kind of break that wall and get through that kind of like symbolic change that it likes to show? Like it showed everybody in Washington with their kentes taking a knee. Yeah. You know, like what did that do for me? What did that do for us? How did that help the movement? Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean when these people are able to capitalize off of Juneteenth? Because Juneteenth mm -hmm. seemed like the last sacred thing we had. And now we don't have it anymore because it's Juneteenth plates in Dollar Tree, Juneteenth plates in Target. <laughs> so like, when do we get to the place where we talk about the real issues, mm -hmm. address and give space and time for the people with the solutions, rather than just, you know, throwing these crumbs out to people so that they believe that our nation is changing or believe that mm -hmm. minds and hearts are changing, but we're not seeing that happen in our actual reality. Mm -hmm. That's a really hard question. That oh, I'm no, say, that's But a, also a fascinating <laughs> one. It looks like Meredith wants to jump in. I was going to say, no, that's, that's not a hard question. I, th I think that's a right question. That's a right question. Um, to the point that was made earlier about the voices that are, are now being heard on the reparations conversation and the question, Michael, that you asked Deb, you know, would you train one of your students to press somebody mm -hmm. about that? That's exactly what has to happen from a media perspective. We do, media has to toughen up and ask questions like, we have the votes to pass H. Bill 40, why is it not happening? That's not necessarily a leading question. Your job as an elected representative is to represent the will of the people who sent you to the state house, to the Capitol, right? And if you are there, and numerically, we can all see this, we can tally up the figures, you have ability to take action those people need to be held accountable for why they are or are not taking a certain action. They need to be able to uh, explain to us what their interests are, who's behind them, and why structural change isn't happening. And unless media presses on those structures and asks people to be transparent about their motives and why they are or are not acting in certain ways, we're going to continue to have pretty conversations. I'm I'm with a lot of folks who are frustrated. I've been doing this sort of work since I was about 14. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, we're, we haven't really gone much of anywhere. So the, the role that media has to take is one, not making itself a tool of, um, frankly, not continuing to be a tool of white supremacy in backing away from tough questions and answers uh, and demanding accountability from those people who are in structural positions of power to actually do something about the problems we're talking about. And to do that, we have to stop serving established power and serve everybody else. And when you put us, working people, strivers, in the center of, of the story, then you get a different type of story. Mm -hmm. I, I was responding, saying it was a hard question in part because you know, the, my existential crisis as a journalist is, great, <laughs> I put this issue out. This issue looks at 20 years ago, we knew everything that uh, we knew a whole bunch of stuff about structural racism and its impact on health outcomes. Nothing's really changed. What is this issue going to change? And how am I going to measure that? So I have a moment of sort of despair of, I don't know if it's going to change anything that we've done this issue. And that's why I was saying this is a harder question. So we have three folks left. We have one minute. Um, I, I want to borrow from what Natalia did and say, could each of you, could each of you actually say who you are and, and say your question and, and ask, ask it, and we'll try to do a little sort of lightning round of answers. Each of us can respond to one of the questions. So can we, can we do that for three minutes? So I'll try to do this. I'm Jen Goldsmith, and um, thank you so much for this incredible panel. So one thing I've been thinking about, you know, there are people who are nostalgic for a time when everybody watched the same news, and, you know, everybody by some definition, you know, that was a, a different generation. But the 
off side of that, the flip is the total balkanization of news and people listen to what they want to hear. And we lose any sense of collectivism. So it makes me fearful that even as the messages and the way of storytelling that you just sort of reimagine journalism, for me, I can say for myself in the past hour, how does that not become a balkanized subset? You know, I, I, I sort of struggle with that dichotomy. And, you know, I get the Boston Globe, I see the Emancipator, but I'd not heard it explained as clearly as you've explained it today. And I almost wish, like, how come the Boston Globe didn't explain to me why this was more than just a sort of another, you know, like another section like the Weekend Guide. So that balance between everybody, from everybody having a different taste of news feels so complicated. And yet the work you're each doing is so critical. So thank you. And that's my question. Thank, thank you. Uh, one, uh, two more questions and just introduce who, who you are and what, uh, what uh, you're interested in. I'm Mary Bassett. I began this morning with all of you. And, and I, I just felt like I should say something to make the journalists, the working journalists among you and those who think about journalists feel a little more cheerful. Uh, because, uh, you know, during the COVID pandemic, when the Trump administration was suppressing public health data, it was journalists who put out the data it was in newspapers that we read about the excess, excess mortality uh, among people of color, and we read the stories that went with it. So I think that there's a really important expository role, and you've raised, uh, so this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, you, you, uh, the question is, how do you get journalists to rise to the occasion? Right now, we are about to hear a decision from the Supreme Court that will eliminate affirmative action. The argument that you made a, a few minutes ago, Michael, about the enrichment of the newsroom is being rejected by lifelong purveyors of our Constitution who were appointed by Republicans who have not won the popular vote in a decade or more. So we, we have a, a new monarchy, almost, in this country. Uh, and these are the same people who sort of set, you know, they have an impact on the news cycle. How do we get journalists uh, to, to start writing the stories uh, that help people question the, the, um, the overarching narrative, which has been so long a part of our, of our uh, culture? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And thank you for the, the reminders that the work does still matter and makes an impact. Um, my name is Jen Brody. Um, I'm a physician. I work at a, a, a local community health center. Um, and um, narrative is so incredibly important. Journalists are doing the work that keeps our democracy alive um, and um, has such an important role to play. And the question that I had for this group is, how do we address the issue of corporate ownership, corporate white ownership of media? How do we, it's not just about the individual journalist wanting to give us the story, right? If the owners are white and are invested in neoliberal policy and white supremacy, we're never gonna hear the true story. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to raise that mm -hmm. issue. Thank you. So, so if we could just, a, l a little lightning round. There was something that you wanted to respond to uh, from those the last three comments. Go for it. I would say as to the balkanization, um, I think that this is a larger conversation about our commitment to media literacy, and it's it's upon every institution to reinvest in media literacy. How many of us got civics education when we grew up? People think that we pay for interviews. People have no idea how the fourth estate works. And I think that in a, a generation or two or three ago, we had some inkling about how things are supposed to work. I think there are things that we can do inside the machine, inside the media, to forecast, um, the, to be transparent about our storytelling process, telling more about how the story came about and uh, where the sourcing comes from and just pulling back the wall. But we need audiences that come prepared with some baseline understanding of what it means to consume this information and how to discern what's credible and what's not credible. And that's what's missing right now. And we need every institution to invest in that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'll just say briefly, I mean, um, we know that the harms experienced in this country are multifaceted and complex for a very distinct reason. And I think uh, journalists and the media have to be committed to uh, being in that for the long term, um, doing these long term investigations, uh, but also not cheating some of the complexity of these issues uh, with a short story. Um, it has had human impact. It has had human costs on uh, many of us and many of our communities um, when these stories are, um, again, there's great things coming out of this space and there's perpetuation um, and preservation of whiteness that is never gonna lead us to the, to the healthy place that we all need to be. The, the question that really resonated for me was about the corporate ownership of media, um, specifically because I've been fielding questions all week about what Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter mm -hmm. means for, you know, uh, the public, the public sphere. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there are a number, there are so many places where we have to work collectively, but I think that's the bottom line is that we have to work collectively in order to push back and to dismantle uh, the systems that we are trying to work against. And that is everything from forming our collectives to be people to buy media when it becomes available. Like this crisis did not happen overnight. It's a, a mix of technologies and economic shifts and the uh, ignoring and maligning of communities that made people not wanna pay for news that made it possible for our new American oligarchs to buy up media properties and thus control narrative. And so it takes people organizing and deciding where they're gonna spend their money and how they're going to spend that money. Um, thinking about co-op structures, thinking about supporting news nonprofits, and thinking about how they confront the messages that come from those organizations that have been purchased. You know, having those conversations with the people that you work with and the people who are members of your family, all of those small things help us to continue to struggle for liberation. It is an ongoing process and it, it's a reminder of what I said before, uh, we may not see, we may not see the benefits of what we're striving for in this lifetime, but we do have to keep fighting. We have to do that together. and We really do have to be organized about the way we do that fight. 